In this edition, we'll be focusing on a security topic, identity and APIs. Because API threats are all around us, cyber attacks are increasing, and each day we see new reports of exploits making the headlines. These vulnerabilities could leave a company exposed to hackers who may leverage APIs to attack and override systems or misuse user data. And as the value of APIs increases in our daily lives, these touch points are becoming more and more important. So what are some of the most common threats facing our services? Well, OWASP does a nice job of listing the top vulnerabilities in this area. Common issues include injection, broken authentication, data overexposure, broken access control, misconfigurations, improper assets management, and so on. Interestingly, many of these boil down to an issue with permissions and access. Who is the requesting party? Are they allowed to access this data? What proof can they offer that they are who they say they are? So many in the API space argue that a greater emphasis on how we handle the identity of the client could work to fix a lot of these threats. So in this hour long segment, today we'll be diving into how APIs could be abused and then cover some strategies to mitigate them. We'll first get an overview of API abuse and mobile threats in the time of a pandemic with David Stewart. And then with Jacoby Deskog, we'll get a status update on identity-driven API security standards like OAuth and OpenID Connect. We'll be doing back-to-back -back lightning talks for this hour-long segment, followed by a group Q&A. So please comment in your questions and we'll be answering them in the Q&A section after these two sessions. So first up, I'm gonna introduce David Stewart with uh, 30 years experience in mobile API security, SaaS business, design services, embedded software tools, and other roles. David is currently focused on growing a global SaaS business, delivering mobile API protection to assure maximum revenue, reduce operating costs, and preserve brand reputation within key verticals of automotive slash mobility, fintech, and retail. And it's sort of been a tradition for the last several years at the Platform Summit for David to provide an update on what's going on with API abuse. So in lieu of, of no physical summit, we're inviting him here to introduce things. Um, so, we're, so we're very curious to see what impact the pandemic has had on the activities of attackers, essentially. So um, yeah, without further ado, take it away, David. I'm going to end my share here, and then you should be able to share your screens. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would rather be uh, in Stockholm in October presenting to uh, everybody in the traditional way, but um, it's not, uh, not happening like that these days. So um, there's a lot to do instead. So what I want to do today is to talk about API abuse and what's been going on in 2020. Um, and the, the identity angle to what I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna make a case that it's very important to think about identifying the what that's using your API and not just the who. Um, and by way of a sort of quick introduction or refresh on API abuse, um, what what is it? Well, it's uh, it's you know unauthorized access to the API or using your API in a way uh, for which it wasn't intended to be used, and um, there are lots of different reasons that people would attempt to do this. They can be as mainstream as obvious as taking over a bank account and emptying it of its contents or using it to uh, launder um, um, illegal funds. It could be as mainstream or, or as subtle as scraping data from a retail site in order to see product availability and pricing so that you can set your own pricing below that. It could be messing with um, the, the platform services just in order to mess with platform services and cause trouble. Or it could be opening new accounts in order to capture rewards, you know, a three month, you might think that getting a free three month Netflix subscription for opening a new account would not be a reason to abuse an API. 
But um, if you if you have a hundred hundred times that or a thousand times that, you can resell the stuff on uh, on the open market. So the point is that if there's a way to game the system um, or cause trouble or make money, then somebody's going to do it um, because they can. Is it a real thing? Well, I think you all know that it is a real thing, and I you know since we're I, I had to use a, a Nordic APIs article here just to il illustrate uh, some examples of major uh, data breaches via APIs. Um, but we don't often get all the details about exactly what's happened with these APIs. So I, I like to actually use other examples. This is a recent one. The great thing about doing this job is that there's always new examples. Um, this is one uh, where a guy wrote a script to figure out which um, McDonald's branches in the US had a working ice cream machine and which didn't. Um, now it's a it's a somewhat trivial example, but there's some quite interesting things you can see from that, and it's, it has a direct parallel with what happens on a bigger scale. So um, he uh, reverse engineered the whole story. Is here you can read it and, uh, if you're interested. It's quite quite a good story. Um, he reverse engineered the uh, API of the McDonald's app in order to be able to do this, and, and built a script that would interrogate all the different branches to see whether their ice cream machine was working or not, um, and that in and of itself wasn't very difficult. Um, the one thing that was quite interesting to me about the story was that when he first did it, um, he got blocked quite early on because of the frequency at which he was hitting the API and, it, and it, they obviously had some internal checks that, um, that he fell foul of. But it wasn't very difficult for him to work out what the algorithm was and work around it so that very soon he was able to um, you know, hide underneath the radar. And that's a very common situation that we see uh, in our business. So as I say, an interesting story to read if you, if you have time. Now I mentioned mobile in that last example and mobile as Bill said is what we do. Um, we, we believe that the mobile channel is the most difficult API to protect. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and because of these reasons, it requires a, a, a specific solution. And this, the first reason is that the mobile app can be downloaded by anyone and they can spend as much time as they like studying it. Um, reverse engineering it, looking at the API, API requests and protocols, et cetera, in order to be able to design a script that looks exactly like it's coming from the app itself. And there's nothing you can do about that because that's the mechanism that the app stores operate on. So you have to assume that any uh, API transaction coming in from a mobile app is, uh, is untrust untrustworthy um, and you need to validate um, characteristics of it. Um, and that's a difficult, a difficult challenge. Um, the second thing is that the app itself provides a kind of bottleneck, if you like, in the, in the communication channel, um, because you, know, you usually have a single user logged into it. Uh, the app user interface is only allowing you to uh, do certain numbers of transactions. Therefore, the whole thing is limited. Now, once you have a script, or a bot connected to an API, particularly mobile APIs, where there's a lot of business logic in the apps, then quite often you find that a lot of data can be extracted very, very quickly. And that's something that, that isn't often appreciated by um, people that deploy APIs that service mobile apps, but it can be, can be a problem. So it's, a, it's not only a difficult channel um, to protect, it's a very important channel to protect for that reason. So Bill talked about uh, the OWASP top 10, which is great, saves me having to do it. Um, uh, all that stuff's really important. The point I want to make is that even if your API has no vulnerabilities at all, it's the perfect API. It has no uh, flaws in it at all. You can still be abused because the traffic that's coming into you is impersonating a genuine app or, or genuine uh, traffic source um, it's not actually exploiting a vulnerability in the API. So it's necessary for you to think about how you would be able to tell that a script was using your API rather than a genuine mobile app instance. So let's switch now to what's been happening in, uh, in 2020. Um, of course, um, it's not a surprise to anyone that the mobile uh, activity or the digital activity rather has, uh, has increased. And this is a McKinsey study that's uh, recently came out. It, it's, a, it's a global study. It covers all aspects of digital. It's not mobile, it's not APIs, it's all digital transactions. Um, but what you can see is uh, what you'd expect, which is that the number, the percentage of 
transactions being done digitally is much higher than it was even at the end of last year. What interested me about this particular study was that what they're actually saying is that where we are right now is three years ahead of what um, was being predicted even as recently as last year. So obviously nobody knew about the pandemic, but it's really interesting to see, you know, obviously you'd expect that things would be accelerated, but they've been accelerated even more than probably most people imagined. So we're now three years ahead of what anybody predicted um, in 2019, and we're probably gonna stay there. So um, that is a lot of additional digital activity. Coming back to a bit closer to home on, on our data, this is, this is a, a chart from, um, from our own um, analytics, uh, what's going on in the, in, 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 in within our customer base. And what I did here was just sort of show you what kinds of growths we're seeing within the, the different market sectors, which are probably the biggest market sectors that, um, that we operate in. So this is aggregated data across uh, all of our customer base. And what you can see is that retail, maybe as you'd expect, has been growing quite steadily through, through the, the year. Retailers who maybe didn't have much of a, a strong mobile presence now have a significant mobile business. Fintechs um, are doing a lot more business as well. Um, as you might expect, people doing more uh, transactions uh, via their mobile devices since they're working from home, et cetera. None of this is tremendously surprising. And transportation, which in our case is mainly uh, automotive mobility services, et cetera, took a big hit in March and April. Again, as you would have expected, uh, has been flat for a while and now is uh, working its way um, back up, although it hasn't quite reached the point that it was at, at the beginning of the year. And the one that I found most interesting when I put this together was uh, was healthcare. So, um, you know, healthcare was, mobile healthcare was, of course, growing anyway, but it didn't, it wasn't immediately impacted by the pandemic. It was several months later when we started to see a lot of increased activity and I think what's happened there is that what we've seen is that people have recognized that there's, there's an opportunity for more mobile healthcare services and people have started to um, you know, offer them and deploy them. And of course, people have started to use them. So um, those services were not immediately available when the pandemic hit. So it's taken, so you see that sort of three month lag uh, while people got their act together and now we're beginning to see some pretty explosive uh, um, growth there. We actually have some research work going on in uh, about around the security of mobile healthcare um, APIs and apps that uh, will be coming out in the next couple of weeks that uh, you'll find quite interesting and possibly quite scary. So that's the good stuff. Um, mainly things, the digital businesses have been growing uh, reasonably, reasonably comfortably. The, the bad side of the story is um, that the, 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 the abuse has been increasing proportionately, um, if not higher than, than those rates. And this is uh, um, a screenshot from our analytics showing you some live data of a particular, particular app, and it's pretty representative of what we see. So what you're seeing here is, um, is basically repelled uh, attacks, various different kinds of, um, of entities trying to attach to the API and use the API. And um, on the right side, it's not full, full, you can't actually see the full list, but you're seeing things like tampered apps, you're seeing things like apps running in cloned environments, apps with debuggers attached, apps running on emulators, apps with um, implementation frameworks like Frida Expose, et cetera, attached to them and so on. So there's a whole range of ways in which people use um, the mobile apps and scripts and so on and the environments they set up in order to be able to, to use the APIs. So um, yeah, so uh, there's a definite significant increase in the, uh, in the amount of API abuse traffic that's out there. And uh, you probably have some within your platforms as well. Um, you, you may or may not know that, but uh, they, it, it will be there. So what are we gonna do about this? Um, what I've done is put in place a five-step plan that, I would, uh, that we would certainly recommend that you, you take a look at with respect to you know, how you're going to uh, secure at least the mobile channel, but you could extend this to, uh, to, to the whole API system. 
First step is to block malicious uh, bots and automated scripts. And you, I mean, that's obvious really, because I've been talking about how that's the main, the main, the main threat point. And you know, many um, mobile apps use a static API key to identify themselves to the back end, uh, which is not a very secure way of doing uh, something which we've been saying for many years, but still uh, people do it. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't use API keys. What I'm saying is that you should protect them so that they can be used at scale. So if an API key becomes available, um, if it's put into a script, it won't be useful. And the way to do that is to require that your mobile apps prove that they're live and genuine instances. Because if they do that, then you know that the API key and the API transaction is coming from a genuine app instance, which means that any bot and automated traffic um, will be blocked. And this, um, I'll say again, is the most common mechanism that's used for uh, abusing APIs. Step two, you need to reject any apps running in compromised environments. Um, so you may have a genuine app, but it may be connected to um, hacking tools. It may be running in an unsafe environment. Uh, and by unsafe environment, I don't just mean root and jailbreak detection. I mean, all of the things that, some of the things I talked about earlier on and a lot more besides. So there are, um, there are many um, environmental uh, uh, mechanisms that you need to check for. And you need to check this on an ongoing basis. It's not enough to do it when the app launches or when the app installs. Uh, you need to do it all the time uh, in order to make sure that something hasn't been attached to the app after it, after it was launched, uh, for example. And as I said, there's a whole range of things that you'll want to check um, in order to define that your app is running in a good environment. Because if you don't do that, then there's danger that you, you, your app is being manipulated. Either data is being taken from it or um, it's doing things under the hood that's not expected by the, uh, by the user. Step three is you need to secure your API calls. I'm sure you all do that already, um, TLS being a standard way of doing that. Um, but TLS, um, as, as always seems to be the case, there are plenty of tools out there that you can use to, um, to mess with existing systems, um, and TLS is, uh, is no exception, so there are decryption tools uh, available. What we suggest is that all uh, connections are pinned, and certificate pinning is an effective way on top of TLS to make sure that um, the channel is, is, is well secured. Um, Sometimes people say to us that they're a bit concerned about certificate pinning, they're worried about maintenance and what happens if a certificate needs to be replaced and all of that stuff. And, and certainly those are things that you need to think through, but it can be done and uh, done correctly. It's very, very effective. And it should be, it should be a piece of the, of the puzzle uh, within your uh, API platform. Step four is to authorize user actions in an app context. And what I mean by that is Authenticating the user is a necessary step, um, but it is not on its own enough to allow an API transaction to happen. And so it's important to join together the authentication of the user with the authentication of something else, which proves that the user is running, is, is sending their instructions from a, um, from a trustworthy environment. And so, and if you think about it, it's, it's like having authenticating the user and authenticating the app uh, as an example, those would be two independent processes. So as a result, if you, if you authenticate both and bind them together, you actually get a very significant um, decrease in the attack space for the bad guys. And it's a very significant boost in your, in your security. So it is a, it is a, a really nice uh, thing to do in order to really close down the possibilities um, of what the bad guys can do. Um, so um, think about that um, uh, as well. A second, think about it, you can think about it if you're used to thinking about you know, two-factor authentication, then you can think about this as two separate factors, um, the user and also the, uh, the app from which the user is calling. And finally, um, keeping security capabilities up to date with emerging threats. Well, that seems pretty obvious um, as well, um, but particularly for mobile, this, is, this can be quite a challenge because if a new security feature requires a new app to be released, um, then that has to go through your development and test process, then it has to go to the app store, then it has to be downloaded by users, then your users have to 
um, user base has to get up to a certain percentage of using the new app before you can switch off the old app. And you can be sure the bad guys are using the old app and they won't upgrade until they absolutely have to. Um, so um, even knowing about the emerging threats is one thing, but being able to keep your security up to date with those threats is a second thing. And therefore you need to have an over the air capability, something that allows you to add new detections. Um, for example, those environmental checks I was talking about over the air so that you don't have to um, release a new version of your app to do that, because that just, that just creates a huge time lag um, that the bad guys can, um, can exploit. So the five steps are summarized here, and um, you'll see that the trend is that what I'm trying to propose here is that you really need to know, in addition to who's using your API, you need to know what is using your API, because that allows you to differentiate in the mobile space between a genuine mobile app instance running in a good environment with something which is not. And, and if, you, if you do that, if you follow those steps, you can cut your, uh, the fraudulent traffic by at least 90% based on what we've seen. And, and this, is, this is not, um, you know, this is the plan that we follow with our customers. So it's not like it's not been done before. Um, there's a bunch of case studies. I'm just gonna mention one of them in the interest of time. Um, Papara is a very fast growing fintech uh, in Turkey. It's a very dynamic environment um, and has some really quite interesting uh, characteristics. We've been working with them for a couple of years now and um, I think their user base has grown by about 10X uh, in the time that we've been working with them. But of course, um, that growth has been matched by um, attempts to uh, execute fraudulent activities. So uh, we've been working with them to cut that down and there's a whole, case study which uh, goes into all the details of what um, what we did and what they did and, and how it all worked together and the successes that we had. So um, if you're interested in, in how we can help, then I encourage you to, to have a read of that. And there's a bunch of other ones um, on the website too. This is obviously just a subset of the customers that we have because not all of them are prepared to be public references. But please go and have a look. Um, now, in terms of just covering very, very high level of what exactly a prove is just for your, for your to, to get you curious, I hope. Um, this little animation I hope will work. So basically there's an SDK that goes in the mobile app. When the app launches, um, the first thing that will happen is it will, it will do um, a DNA test of itself and, and return the result to the approved cloud service. And in the cloud service, um, we'll verify to see if that um, was, was correct and it passed the tests, in which case it gets delivered a very short lifetime token to the uh, app, which then gets sent down the API to your backend. And you can verify that that is a valid token. So obviously there's a lot more meat underneath that, which I won't have time to go into, but um, the concept of it is that that gets done every few minutes. So there's a constant uh, authentication and verification that the app is present, that the app's not been modified, that the app is running in a a safe environment. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. It's invisible to your users, so there's no impact on the uh, user experience. Okay, just um, very, very briefly, this is the sort of list of environmental checks that you need to be looking at, and this list is growing all the time. Um, so um, there are a lot of things that the, uh, the bad guy can get up to, a lot of site signals that you can use in order to uh, check to see whether everything's going well uh, or whether there's, uh, there's dangerous activity going on. Security policies, detections can all be uh, updated to the uh, app in the field, uh, live over the air. So again, it's instant updates of the app when, when new things, or instant updates of the approved SDK um, when new things come along. And that's obviously something you can use for certificate pinning too. We've implemented a very simple to use dynamic certificate pinning mechanism that allows you to uh, update your certificates uh, over the air. So if you're worried about you know, maintaining certificates, this is, a, this is a, a very simple way to do it. And the analytics I mentioned before will give you lots of information and detail about who's using your, you know, how your app has been used what kinds of attacks are, are, are being repelled, et cetera. There's a lot of data that you can get from the analytics as well. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, um, if you're curious about Approve, there's a link here to the resource page uh, where you'll find all kinds of videos and quick start guides and 
um, case studies, etc. And if you would like uh, to have a chat with us about how we can help, um, you can even book a call with us using the link here as well. And we'll be very happy to, uh, to chat through your particular use case. And um, I hope I'm not over time, um, but I'm finished now. Okay, awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you, David. And this is where the platform summit will give you the applause. <laughs> Uh, yeah, excellent overview of you know where we're at with uh, the pandemic, and it's really interesting seeing all that data. Like you said, you know, it's nothing that we didn't expect, but um, really helps prove the need for better security right now. As things are increasing exponentially, so do the threats, if not more so. Like yep. you said, um, so yeah, thanks so much for presenting. We're gonna shift things over to Jacoby Deskog, and I'm just gonna give a brief overview of um, what he's going to be talking about and and who he is. So uh, Jacoby Deskog is an identity specialist and, and the CTO at Curity. Most of his time is spent working with security solutions in the API and web space. He has worked with both designing and implementing OAuth and OpenID Connect solutions for large enterprise deployments as well as small startups. So it's been almost a decade, we realized, since the inception of OAuth and OpenID Connect. And a lot has happened since, both in the standards and with the use cases they apply to. So in his talk, um, Jacob's going to go through these technologies, uh, their current state, and where he believes they're heading. So yeah, super excited to learn more from, from Jacob here. And like I said originally, um, if you're tuning in and you're watching live, feel free to drop some questions in the Q&A and we're gonna take everything after this presentation. So yeah, take it away. All right, thank you, Bill. Let me see if I can share my screen. All right, is it sharing? Okay, yeah, Jacobi Disco. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about OAuth and OpenID Connect, as I usually do. But today we're going to zoom in a bit on on what's next. Uh, like Bill said, we've been we've been living with this for a year, um, almost a decade now, and uh, the world isn't the same, and the standards aren't the same, and um, and what's happening. Um, so let's start by by looking back a bit. 2012, um, eight years ago. Apple, they just released the iPhone 5. Uh, there were 750,000 apps on the App Store already in 2012, and 20 billion downloads that year only. And 20 billion downloads is actually as much as all the years together before that. So we're really like hitting the hockey, hockey stick there. Um, when it comes to Android, it, it's pretty similar. We're, we're looking at the Galaxy S3 from Samsung, uh, Android roughly version four, and almost the same amount of apps on the App Store, almost the same amount of downloads. So we're looking at a pretty big explosion. And what this means for us in the API space is that this is when the API universe is starting to explode. Um, we saw that API, app to API communication is, is the big thing now. Um, obviously, because we the, the way apps are being built is, is quickly transforming from being a, a, a sort of a monolithic app to something that communicates with the backend. Uh, most logic, most data, everything is, is stored elsewhere and the app is becoming a thin, thin client. Obviously, it works very well for mobile scenarios. So, so this is changing rapidly. And we're seeing this both for first party and third party apps, both the homegrown ones for, for our own company and, and others using our APIs or us using others' APIs. And this is when OAuth uh, enters the picture. This is 2012. That's when OAuth 2.0 was ratified. There was obviously OAuth 1 before that, but that didn't really take off in the mobile space as much and uh, for various reasons. Uh, but OAuth 2 uh, made quite a good success story all the way from the start. And 
it's good to know that OAuth 2 was really designed as a framework rather than a standard. Um, it's, it's meant to be built upon to be improved. And what OAuth 2 solves, I'm not going to go through, through the details in this talk, um, but essentially it solves a, the problem uh, that David was mentioning here. How do I get an app to communicate with an API in a way that the API knows who that app is, who the caller is, but specifically, how do we involve the user in this? Because we don't trust the app necessarily. So we don't want the, the app to see the user's credentials. The user has an account with an OWASP server. So we involve an OWASP server to delegate access to the app so the app can call the API. Um, and we use something called access tokens to uh, sh ship this information around or this data around. But pretty soon we found we could call them shortcomings. Um, and we can also say that they were intentional, some of them. But there were things that the spec simply didn't cover. And the use cases were bigger than the spec. So when it came to mobile, pretty soon there were security issues found. Uh, there were UX pains pretty early on. And I'll go through those a bit, because they're not insignificant. Um, and in other areas, we had the emergence of single page applications. These weren't a big thing 2012. Um, these are the browser only applications, React, Vue, and those type of things. And there were other assumptions made around access tokens. And so that, that works in most cases, but not all cases. So um, more things were needed. So when you start looking at these type of, of problems that OAuth is trying to address, it sounds pretty easy. We have an API and we have a client and we somehow need to de delegate access between the two. But then you realize, but the app, it could be a mobile app, but it could be a browser app. It could be a single page app. It could be a TV set-top box. It could be a server. It could be a kiosk. There's a lot of different types of devices to begin with or, or clients. Um, but there's also different ways in which these interact with APIs and the, the sort of level of security that is required for, for an app to communicate or to retrieve data from a particular API. I mean, we have a very big difference, obviously, between a banking grade API and a, and a weather API. So there's a lot of nuances and variants in the OAuth flows. And what this meant was that, well, the, the good old OAuth spec very, very quickly was accompanied by, by other specifications. And this is normal in IETF. This is how it usually works. Um, but in OAuth, it grew quite quickly to quite a, a lot of specs. And these are just a few. So we have specs for dynamically registering clients or apps. We have specs for revocation of tokens, how to use JSON web tokens. That's not part of the core spec. Uh, we have how to use uh, assertions um, and, and how to constrain tokens to get more secure access tokens, send a constrained tokens using mutual TLS. And like I mentioned, also there was this the these problems with mobile applications, uh, security-wise. So the Pixie or PKCE standard uh, or spec was added to solve that, together with the uh, native app best current practice, which explains how to do mobile development with OAuth. And same thing, single page best current practice. So there's a lot of these things, a lot of these specs uh, being added to it, and. Why am I listing all of this? Well, we have OAuth 2. And obviously, what's the purpose of a spec? Well, it's interoperability. So when somebody asks, do you support OAuth 2? And you say, yes, both of you should know. OK, great. Then, then we can work together. But when OAuth 2 means a base spec and you know 30 other things on top in order to make it work properly, interoperability becomes a problem. Um, so in this community, what's happening now is the modest step of OAuth 2.1 is being uh, taken. And what that is, is, is simply a, a merge of all these specs, of all the relevant ones, all the important ones that, that are now considered to be, if we would have done OAuth now, these would have been in the core specification. Some things are removed that are considered not, not to be used anymore. There's still debates. It's not. It's not ready. Oh, what do I want? Uh, some extensions are simply referenced from the base spec to make sure that 
it's it's clean. Like if you're going to do this, look there. Um, but there's not a whole lot of new things. I, I don't think there's anything new. Last time I checked, it's it's all of these things just put together in a in a in a nicer bundle. But what this will give us is interoperability. Now we can ask, do you support OAuth two dot one? And if someone says yes, you know then okay, yeah, it's these things. Then then I know I can do the mobile case like this and and so on. So that that's what we're looking at. So it sounds like it's not a whole lot of things happening. Well, there are other things. There's uh, the GNAP um, or OAuth XYZ, which is very early stages where it's a transactional based OAuth being looked at. I'm not going to go into that today because it, it's too early on uh, so far. But what I wanted to mention and talk about a bit is what OAuth leaves out. And that's authentication, answering the question who you are. Um, authentication methods uh, or authenticators, they're called in some specs, um, are a way to answer the question, who are you, with some degree of certainty. You can send an email, click a link, you can visit Facebook and get a response, uh, send an SMS, use some EID, you can use username, use username password or, or some other secure app of some sort. All of these methods, we consider them islands. There's a way to, to, to log in using Facebook, and there's another way to log in using SMS, or there's probably a lot of ways to log in using SMS. There's no, there's no standard on like, how do I do this? How do I do that? That covers all authentication methods. There are standards covering each one, perhaps, in some cases. Uh, but on top of OAuth, there was one standard added, which is OpenID Connect. And it unifies how to start and terminate the authentication flow. And that's pretty important still, even though it leaves a few things behind. So what OpenID was, was contributing with on top of OAuth uh, was not anything to do with the API. It was something to do with the app itself and how I can request a login. How can I ask for like, I want the user to have been by their device the last 30 minutes. I, I don't want to use an SSO session that's older than that, or I want to force a login right now, or I want this particular authentication method to be used, or those type of things. That's what OpenID adds. So it gives us a contract from an app to the OAuth or OpenID server then to, to ask for particulars when it comes to authentication. And it also gives us a standard way of understanding the result, which is an ID token explaining the user blah logged in this way that time. And this can be then used also for federation. And OpenID Connect is built on top of the framework standard OAuth. So anything OAuth was also given for free underneath, if you will. Why does that work? Why do we only need the start and the end? Well, so far, that's because we're using a browser. And a browser has some nice properties. Uh, first of all, most people are using one of four browsers, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Edge. There's probably a few more that are very popular these days. But on the desktop, that's, that's the ones. Uh, they enforce security in a very good way. Um, they comply with security headers. They make sure cookies aren't sent to the wrong party uh, or that JavaScript can tamper with them when they're not supposed to. They make sure a redirect is followed without the something inter interfering with that or that a frame is shown on the correct origin. All of these things are things that a server can use to rely on the client to, to do things the right way. That's why we like browsers. They're generic like that uh, from a security perspective. Um, so when, when we're doing mobile, it, it's still a browser. So I mentioned UX before, and look at look at the UX here for, for mobile then for OpenID Connect. So when we want to start an OpenID Connect flow on a mobile device, it opens a browser, like a browser um, system browser perhaps, or, or something sliding in like a Chrome tab or, or Safari authentication session. Um, and that contacts the OpenID Connect provider, which takes the user through a bunch of steps, enter your username, get an SMS, enter the OTP code, blah, blah, blah. And when it's done, it, it closes the browser usually and, and redirects back to the app. And the app can then use whatever code it got to redeem that and get the access token. This is uh, a code flow in OAuth and OpenID Connect. 
uh, abbreviated. But what if we use more things? So we open the browser and then the OpenID Connect provider says, yeah, great, I uh, see your username. The next step is you're gonna open another app, like an EID app and, and do authentication there. And, whoops, I didn't have that slide that I thought. And when that's done, it will close the app and then it will close the browser and, and return. So we're, we're looking at, we can start to understand why is UX not always perfect here? Um, why doesn't this make up an award-winning app? Mm -hmm. So today, passwords are no longer the preferred way if they ever were, but we have other means now of, of authentication uh, that can serve instead of password. We have understood now that login is more than just enter a username password and, and get something back, it's a journey. Um, you have to take the user through steps. We're using multi-factor authentication almost all the time, which means we're, we're guiding the user for first do this, then do this, then click on every red light on this image and then do that. So we're taking the authentication is a journey for the user. And we can use all these fancy, fancy things now like key fobs and biometrics or face ID and authentication apps. And state of the industry is that mobile developers still dislike the browser, just like they did 2012, the UX of that. There has been some attempts to, to do things, to improve things. Uh, in OpenID Connect, there's a standard called SIBA being worked on, uh, client-initiated back-channel authentication. It's not particularly aiming at solving all of these problems I just mentioned, um, but it could be used for that. Essentially, it doesn't use a browser. So a device, an app, or whatever it could be, a kiosk or, a, or something, would call the OpenID server and say, hey, please authenticate user A for me. And the OpenID provider would then somehow call an app and have that app authenticate. And then in step three, it return some tokens to the user. That's CBA in a, in a very short uh, form. So that makes sense. It's pretty useful. You could use that for same device, switch between apps and stuff. But it doesn't really help us guide a user through a, a whole journey of multi-factors and stuff like that. It had to be, it, it's more contained than that. We call this the hamburger problem, the authentication hamburger. Um, the authentication hamburger is a nice bun with a bunch of authentication methods in the middle. And what OpenID is, is really the, the top and the bottom bun here. And we're wondering where's the beef? Because OpenID starts the flow and then it comes to the middle. And, and in the middle, we perhaps start by asking for a username password and then we uh, send an email and then we're, we're done. So all of that has to be done. That's not part of the spec. So OpenID knows nothing about that. It just knows I have these requirements, please make sure they work. So it's not standardized at all. And that works because we have a browser, like I mentioned before, because the browser has some nice properties of it. It shows, it guides the user. It presents something and the user knows what to do because he can read the text, he can see the images, it will click through and go to the next step. That's why the browser can be used in the middle here and is essentially the beef for OpenID Connect. But we don't like the browser. So if we just step back real quick and see where are we and where do we need to go? Well, we've solved authentication requests. We know how to ask for it. We know how to tell the device, please authenticate like this. We know how to understand the result. Yeah, OpenID gives us both of those. And OAuth gave us API access. What we don't have is a native user experience here. We don't have a whole lot of ways for the user to control their own identity. I won't go into that today, but that's an important thing. We'll talk about more in other talks. Uh, and we don't have a generic way for combining arbitrary authentication methods. How do I combine username password with email or not username password, uh, a key fob with, with something else? We like to talk about API-driven authentication. We don't have the browser, so we need to emulate the browser. If we're gonna do something for the, the, the poor, um, mobile developers here, we need to solve this using hypermedia. Why? Well, first of all, like I said, hypermedia, if you don't know what that is, it is what the browser is doing. It 
it does a request. It does a get to a server. And uh, the uh, web server responds with an HTML page. And that's in a hypermedia format. So it shows you links and actions. What can you do on this page? So each response from the server tells you what you can do to get to the next place. So yes, there's a form here. I'll click submit. And that's a post. And then I'll get, a, get another uh, response with a new page. This is nice because authentication, when you think about it, is a state machine. You have a beginning and you have an end. So you begin, you enter your password, and then you re request an OTP, and then you enter that OTP, and then you move on. Or you begin, you trigger another app, and then you simply wait and pull or wait for a push or whatever. And then once you receive that response, you're done. So authentication is really moving, or this user journey is a state machine on the server side. So we need an API that can, that can help the user move through this state machine. And like the browser, HTML was great, but it's too verbose. We can do it more limited. So we can make a, a JSON version that, that contains just a few elements we need. We need actions. So we can ask, we can do a get to the server and say, hey, how should we start this authentication? And the server will respond, hey, yes, you should render two fields that are input boxes. One is a username, one is password, and a button. That's the action. And when you click that, it should post here. And when that was done, you'll get a new thing to render. Why would we do that? Well, if we limit the hypermedia responses that we can do, we can do a native rendering of this in the UI. Uh, it could be generic. So the UI can understand that these are the, the types of elements that can occur, and we can use those to render the authentication flow. And then if an administrator or, or a business manager or something says, hey, we changed the terms of services, or we have an ongoing attack, you need to add this method now, enable the second or third factor on everybody. You can do that without redistributing the app because the app is just a hypermedia client. It understands how to render these things because that's built in already. It doesn't know, it doesn't need to know that this comes before that. That's up to the configuration of the, or the OpenID Connect provider to give you. But we trusted the browser. So what do we do now? How do we trust this? Well, I think David mentioned it. Earlier, we, we use attestation to do that. We need to know that the app is who we think the app is. And, and luckily, things are happening uh, a lot in this area. And both Android and iOS are, are providing better and better means for this. And there are great companies uh, helping out with this as, as well, like Approve and others. Um, we could wish for some standardization, of course, around this. Um, but we need some attestation uh, to trust who's calling. Because the first argument that with OAuth and OpenID is that, well, we, try, we like the browser because then we know you're only entering your credentials or giving the credentials to the OpenID provider, the, the organization that wants the credentials, or that should have it at least. Um, yes, but like I said also, if you don't trust the app, we have other means for authentication. Maybe username password then shouldn't be used. Maybe we should be using WebAuthn or some strong authentication app that context switches to. So we, we leave the app with nothing. It can't steal anything because the authentication isn't done there, but it still drives the flow. So depending if you're building a first party app for your own organization or third party app that others are building, uh, you have to be able to have different factors and now Finally, we have those. There are enough standards and enough ways to authenticate for this to be possible. So what we need now, the coming years uh, after OWASP, after OpenID Connect, is to solve the hamburger problem. We need to figure out how does this beef look like? Uh, and that is not just figuring out more authentication standards. It's to figure out how to drive authentication. That's the big problem, not to do authentication, but to drive it, to move through the steps in a way that can be done natively on many platforms. And that's left outside. So we, we at Curity, we're working, we're building these things. We have a, an authentication API. We're seeking to standardize it. We would wish that the attestation part would be standardized as well. But what we need to do in, in all of these communities now is to start listening to the mobile developers and, and actually solve the UX problem. It's been 
eight years since OAuth was in, um, since the inception of OAuth and, and nothing really has happened. So we think it's time. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, shoot us an email or, or on Twitter and uh, let's have a conversation and, and move forward. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, fantastic overview of the history of app development and what has really skyrocketed and led to the introduction of these standards. Um, that's kind of my first hearing of OAuth 2.1, actually. So uh, we, we have to follow that on the blog. Even if nothing much has really <laughs> been added, it seems like a good moves toward interoperability nah, it's, there. It's still an important step, yeah. I think. Cool. Um, yeah, well, this is great. I'd, I'd love to open the floor and uh, try to combine these uh, these two focuses. Um, yeah, perhaps kind of spinning off of David's talk uh, for you, Jakob, um, are you noticing any changes in the identity space and standard space, like in the wake of the pandemic and with all these increased attacks? Or do, do these uh, standards just kind of uh, are in their own world and not really respond to that because it's, it's a slower process? Uh, it's not slower, I wouldn't say. I, I mean, uh, I, we do see a lot of interest and it's growing with the pandemic. Yeah. I would also say that, I mean, the reason we're talking about this authentication API now, and it's because it's drive, it's driven by mobile and, and mobile yeah. is clearly taking over and it didn't go so deep into it, but if you compare a single page application with a mobile app, they're very similar. I mean, they're both like thin clients that are communicating right. with some API and they both have the same problem. They don't want to jump away and leave the context where you're at. They want to build great UX. And as security people, we, we start, we need to listen and actually yeah. solve the problem where they are. Otherwise they're just going to work around it, which they've been doing a lot and then make yeah. more insecure uh, app. So yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of interest for these type of things because it's more digital services are being deployed now at a faster rate. For sure. so, mm. I mean, that's great to hear. It seems like you both are advocating to start listening to mobile developers more in, in different ways. Um, I, I think we yeah. have no choice. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's actually interesting that um, one of the trends that you see is, it, I, I, the way I look at the market is there's quite a, a difference between, if you like, some more traditional companies and their attitude towards security where they want to understand all the detail and they want to you know, go through long processes to uh, establish the efficacy of the security. And then you've got the emerging companies who, I'm not saying they don't take security seriously because that would be a wrong message to put out. It's not that they don't take security seriously. It's just that they they don't necessarily believe that to be their core competence. And they're, they're happy to work with companies, you know, like the two companies presenting today who are experts in their particular areas and trust them yeah to deliver a solution that works without them having to understand under the hood exactly how it all works. You know, and I think yeah. that, that that feels to me like a bit more of a new, well, not, not a brand new trend, but as an accelerating trend um, where in a way sometimes, um, you know, you might think that the most common conversation we have with customers, our customers is about, you know, how to make the security better um, and, those conversations do take place, but, but an equally common conversation is how can you make it easier and easier mm -hmm. and easier and easier to use? You know, right. so we already yeah. think we built something that's easy to use, but clearly people want it to be even easier than that. So um, I think there is, uh, and that is coming from mobile developers. Um, yeah. And so I think there is a, a, a desire to plug and play and go. Um, without having to understand the details. And, and that is a, a growing trend, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. I think reusability here is key. Just like anything you're putting into your tool chain, into your development environment these days, uh, it seems to me like security is just another thing that should probably be outsourced because people have already invented these uh, mechanisms and it's you know no point in reinventing the wheel here. Um, it also seems like this API driven authentication approach, um, while it sounds a little bit meta, it could be applied to a lot of different scenarios other than just mobile, right? Yeah, Jacob, yeah. Like you're talking about IoT devices. Uh, yeah, well, anything that uh, it, it, 
there's no limitation really to it. I mean, my my point yeah. is really that authentication is a state machine, and hypermedia is the way to navigate the state machine. Cool. That it's a, it's just a great fit uh, than if that's in a mobile device or as a component on a single page or or on some kiosk or other IoT device. Yeah. That depends. You just have different options, like what you can serve or not. Right. There. Right. How do you get the user to interact? Well, it could be voice, could be something else. So I guess then uh, to put you two at odds, uh, it might just be a balance of developer experience, right? Uh, something super plug and play or like a hypermedia client that developers need to code against. Um, is, is there any, uh, that seems more technical and difficult to implement. Yeah, obviously, I mean, yeah, it is, it is harder, um, but that's because the browser is doing all the job and we're so familiar with uh, with HTML, CSS and whatnot. But yeah. it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be so verbose as, as HTML. It doesn't have to be able to express so much. Um, so I think, I think it'll, it'll require a few two kits and yeah. so, but otherwise I think it will be quite... Could be built upon. Mm. Yeah. Um, I, okay, so I do want to get to some Q&A before we're done here. Uh, we have some questions coming in from Krishnan. I think this is geared toward David. Krishnan is saying the security paradigm is changing. Perimeter slash edge security is not sufficient. What's the solution for the API throttling from internal users? Like users click on any link, they see approximately 4% as per survey. Yeah, any, any responses to that, David? Yeah, it's a slightly different question. So this is presumably to do with uh, things like, you know, phishing emails and so on coming into right. an organization. So I, you know, the, 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 the concept of the security paradigm changing is clear. I mean, the, the old notion of securing a, an, an enterprise by securing its perimeter doesn't make sense anymore because where is the perimeter? Right. Um, and, but this is a slightly different uh, question. This is, this is stuff coming out of the enterprise rather than coming back in. So certainly not my uh, area of expertise. Um, what I hear actually a lot about these kinds of phishing emails is that the most effective mechanism to stop people clicking on them is education, actually. So um, making sure that people understand, you know, when when they should not click on things. Um, yeah. And there may there may well be um, there may well be security solutions for that kind of API throttling coming back out, um, but I'm not aware of them. Gotcha. Jakob, any any ideas on that angle when we're talking like this internal problem? Yeah, no, I, I agree with David. I mean, the the key here is social engineering will will work yeah. as long as yeah. we're not. Edu and the only the only thing against it is education, uh, yeah. more or less, um, and good procedures. Awesome. Mm. Yeah, maybe uh, we could end on that note in terms of education. Um, and do do you guys have any resources or? Uh, blogs or groups that you follow to, to keep updated with the uh, new security trends? Like I know, David, you mentioned, like it's very important for companies to always be uh, considering, you know, new security capabilities and new vulnerabilities in, in their environment. So yeah, I, I guess what, what do you two follow and that you could recommend other people to jump on board with? Um, well, I think that, I mean, I was referring really to, you know, the kind of analytics that you can get from a, a deployed, a deployed platform. So what I'm really looking at when I'm thinking about keeping up to date with the threats is keeping up to date with the threats against your platform. So looking to see what kind of traffic is coming in, you know, even if it's being rejected, you hope it's being rejected, but, you know, looking at it, seeing what people are trying to do, see how much there is. Um, you know, doing some other analysis like that. So yeah. where I said before that I think the trend is that customers don't, don't want to know the details of how the security actually works. What they do want is to be able to see what it's doing and get information about demographics of their install base, uh, which versions of apps are being used, um, you know, what kind of traffic levels they've got, so they can see when things change and also what kinds of 
um, environment and runtime environments uh, that, that are, are existing because I gave a long list of you know, environmental checks that should be part on part and parcel of any kind of app att attestation. It's not sufficient to attest the app. You also need to look at the environment because the app might be good, um, but it's just running, yeah. it's being manipulated by something else. So there's a load of stuff in there. And, and what's interesting too, is that the, the geography of where the app is operating influences what constitutes a good environment. I can speak about this for about three weeks, but um, the, issue is that what's a good environment to me might not be a good environment to you. And so you need the flexibility to be able to say, okay, well, um, you know, rooted phones are fine. Um, jailbroken phones are not fine. And, you know, some characteristics, some runtime characteristics are okay and some ones are not. And, and one of the ways you set those, those policies is by looking at what you've actually got in your demographics. So unless you know, how many instances, I mean, one of the examples we use a lot is cloner apps. So cloner apps are apps you download from the app store that allow you to have multiple instances of the same app running on a single mobile device. And right. those things, some of them are really dangerous because they smash up the sandbox on the device in order to be able to do that. So they open up all kinds of horrible security problems. Now, the point is, how do you know how many people are using your app within a, clone, a cloner app? We can show you that, and then you can decide what kind of security policy. If it rarely happens, then maybe you don't need it. You don't need to ban those those devices. If it happens a lot, then maybe you do. But the point is, without the data and the information, you can't really decide what a good environment is and what a bad environment is. So there's a lot of detail in that, and I think monitoring and managing services by having an access to those kind of analytics are what people really want rather than understanding yeah. the underlying security. Awesome. Yeah, it seems like monitoring is really important for education in, the, in this perspective. Um, yeah, Jakob, any, any thoughts piggybacking on that? Uh, no, I mean, you can't improve security without knowing what's going on. I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's essentially security 101. So it's uh, insights is, is key here. Um, yeah. yeah. And you guys also advocate for a lot of information around the requesting party, right? The the claims as proof for authentication and authorization. Yeah, I mean, yeah. knowing, making a correct decision is really about trusting the the information yeah. you get. So I mean, um, I, I know what David was talking about how to secure like pin the certificate or or make sure that. Oh. Uh, it's an uninterrupted line between you and the app. There's a bunch of ways to do that, but but also when you involve a third party that can sort of be the, the thing you trust on when it comes to making an authorization decision on other aspects than the app, uh, we we think that you should issue these, these claims about the user as much centrally as possible so that your API doesn't really have to rely on, on the app per se, it can rely on just things about the app, but uh, anything that's coming into the API is actually coming from elsewhere. The app itself didn't add information to it. That's pretty important. Cool. And yeah, maybe the same question I asked David, any good resources or blogs to keep up to date with the standard space mm -hmm. that you follow? Uh, yeah, well, it's a lot of Twitter for me actually, but yes. uh, and then, and then unfor un and unfortunate, fleets. yeah, ex oh, I haven't or gotten that. Whatever yet. they're called, fleets. In, in my <laughs> in my update, it doesn't show yet. Luckily, yeah. fleeps. I don't know. The the um, the standards there, we're following them on the mailing list uh, mainly. Um, I think that's it's it's a pretty good way to keep up to date, but. Um, then for fun, I can recommend a good good pod, uh, Darknet Diaries, just to hear about interesting breaches all over right, and get yeah. get a bit scared sometimes. It's, that's more for <laughs> leisure. <laughs> <laughs> just, you like to get scared in your free time. Yeah. Re reality check. Scary stories. Yeah. All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, you two, for participating in another live cast. Uh, great to have you both back. Um, I'm just going to do some exit slides and uh, we'll just call it there. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. So um, this has been another Nordic APIs live cast.
just bringing up my notes real quick. So if you, um, I'm just gonna give you some updates before we close out. If you like the content we covered today and want to learn more, um, consider downloading the free identity and APIs ebook, which we just put out at Nordic APIs this month. It's located at nordicapis.com slash ebook. And in it, we've assembled the top Nordic APIs blog posts on many of the topics covered today, um, covering like the API security maturity model, OAuth and, and OpenID Connect. Uh, we even dig into some OAuth flows and how to handle user identity within microservices and many other themes. If you love APIs and want to share your story, our blog is open for community submissions. You can read our submission guidelines and pitch a topic at nordicapis.com slash create dash with dash us. We also operate a newsletter featuring bi-weekly updates from our writing team. And we're covering many pressing areas in the API space from general best practices to reviewing new tools and other topics. So you can sign up on the website to always have a little dash of API knowledge in your inbox. And until it's safe to hold our typical in-person events, we'll just be arranging these monthly webinars. So if you have something interesting to share, feel free to submit a talk and we can consider you as a speaker for an upcoming livecast. And finally, as usual, thank you to our sponsor, Curity. You can learn about their OAuth server and identity-driven API security solutions at curity.io. So that's all for now. Thank you so much to our speakers, David Stewart and Jakob Ideskog. And thank you to everyone who tuned in live and helped generate some quality discussions. So hope to see you at our next event. Bye.